Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. You're in for a real treat. Those of you, you know, who have seen Martin's slides and blogs and everything, it's, it's, uh, they are informative, entertaining, and I'd even be better in person. He put a lot of time into this, so I'm sure you will appreciate it. And there we go. All right, so how I did it. Most of you uh, actually know this story already. Matter of fact, uh, you may have seen at the end of uh, the notes there about uh, uh, submitting stuff for the newsletter to Liz. That takes on some special importance now because there's going to be some big holes in the newsletter uh, <laughs> starting now. But um, yeah, most of you know this story. John asked me if I would do the uh, presentation tonight, so if it turns into a train wreck, you can blame him. Uh, and you know, I, we, we like to try to stick to the for, uh, format of 45 minutes. I thought to myself, well, I could probably do it in 45 hours, but I'd prefer 45 days. Uh, but I did a little work, and I think I got this down to, to do it. Some quick stats. Roughly 2,500 plus days from uh, start of uh, the project to completion. 4,000 plus official build hours. 9,000 plus photos, files, documents. Endless ups and downs over the past seven years and a sizable fortune. That's what it went into this project. As for this presentation, keep your hands and feet inside the coaster at all times, and please hold questions until the end. Uh, cell phones off, everybody. Um, I'll make this as fast as possible, and I'll try to start at the beginning. I was born in Michigan in 1957. I always loved planes as a kid. I was one of those kids that looked up in the sky every time I heard a motor. This is a replication of a uh, more, one of my more popular drawings, which was B-17s. This is a circa first grade. Okay. Uh, 1978, I started flight training in Palo Alto, California. Uh, first solo flight was July 27th, 1982. That was put off by a year because um, I was very close to my check ride, and my wife went into labor. And those of you know what happened with my wife, that set me back another year. But uh, yeah, I got my ticket in 82, got my, uh, st you know, private pilot, started thinking about building my own airplane. And then first I was thinking about an avid amphibian. I like the idea of having an amphibian and for emergencies, it's nice to be able to land on water with impunity. Um, but as the time and years went by, the Avid company kind of faded and Vans shot right to the top. Being a Warbird guy all my life, I thought, well, if I, you know, I've always wanted, I, I had dreams of a Mustang, and then it, well, maybe I can handle a T6, well, maybe a Stearman. Then I realized there's no way I can manage any of that, so I'm going to build my own fighter plane, and I chose the RV-8 for that reason. Um, center line seating, very sporty feel, and I'm told by... Um, a lot of people in the know, if you can fly an RV-8, you could probably fly a Mustang just fine. We'll see about that. Um, I received my first pre-planned set uh, in, after I moved to Northern California in 2001. For the next eight years, I was pretty distracted, uh, building a homestead, taking care of um, my daughter and the property by day and playing music at, at night. I built a great... Uh, guest house with a workshop, but instead I build the recording studio instead of buying the air park, airplane parts. So that kept me distracted for about 12 years. We ended up moving back to Michigan, and uh, so when I, the opportunity presented itself, I started working on the shop. This is my detached garage. Um, <laughs> you can see the layout there. Uh, I figured I could probably get do a pretty good job of building the airplane there. The complicated part is uh, there's no direct pass-through, so to move things, move the big parts, I had to go outside and into the other garages. But uh, 
I could find a way to make that work. Um, I started off by building this, um, well, finishing that room, building the workbench, building shelving units, and I uh, converted the, the my little wood shop into a paint booth, which was good for small parts, and I still use that. And um, I also constructed the fan units for the main um, booth, which goes in the, the, the main shop. It's a collapsible thing that uh, you'll see a little bit more of later. One of the other things I did is start thinking about, okay, what do I want this thing to look like? A lot of builders, you know, you either love the, the faux military or you hate it. A lot of guys call this clown paint, and they can call it that all they want. I, I, this is, is going to be my own personal fighter plane, and I'm going to have it look the way I wanted it to. And this was my initial design. Then I started thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm a first-time painter. You're looking at two years right there. So I, I ended up settling on this design, which was the olive drab neutral gray. Um, this is actually, if you want to get technical about it, this is considered the mid-year 1943 paint scheme, kind of, because it's got the olive drab ne neutral gray and it's got the stars and bars with the red border. They only did it that way for like three months of the year. Uh, and uh, so I thought, I don't think I'll see too many of those on the field. So I, I chose that. Um, Let's see, I started, um, oh, one of the interesting things about this is that um, my, when I got ready to start ordering parts, uh, it was August 1st, 2013, um, I hadn't, um, you know, I, I found out that the plan had been redesigned, that pre-plan set expired before I got to start building, so yeah. Nothing to see there. Another long layoff during 2014, getting the shop together and and um, and uh, you know, waiting for money to become available. I knew I'd have funding in uh, 2016, but I just couldn't wait that long. So what I did is I sold my beloved first uh, Mustang convertible and ordered the empennage kit and also got uh, tools from Cleveland Aircraft Tool. They sell bespoke RV tool kits and Cleveland is one of the best companies I've ever done business with. They really stand behind their product. They sell good stuff. If they've got, got something that turns out to not be good, they stop selling it. I know that from experience. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I got going on that stuff. Uh, that was March, February 2015. March 2015 started working on the compressed air system for the shop. I, I plumbed it throughout the whole garage. Um, got a, uh, the biggest compressor that I could get that would run on 110 because I, I didn't have 220 out there and the way my conduit was run, I couldn't have fed a 220 line, so I just got the best one I could that would work in that space. Um, and then, you know, plumbed it with a Max Air system. Got nothing but good things to say about that product. Real easy to use and set up. Okay, now the first mile. So on May 25th, 2015, I received my empennage kit. Um, did the inventory. That's one of the, the joys slash banes of building is doing the inventories of the kit. But I will tell you, do it right down to the last nut and bolt because you'll really be glad you did. Um, by June 2015, I had my stabilizers complete. Matter of fact, uh, that's when I had my first uh, condition inspection from Dan Jones because I left that aft spar off until he got a chance to look at my workmanship. Uh, so I got the stabilizers done. Um, the summer of 2015, there were some distractions. Again, waiting for funds to get in place. Osh was, of course, a wonderful distraction. This is one of my favorite shots from that year. Uh, another distraction that was a lot of fun was uh, crewing for the Ford Trimotor when this chapter hosted it coming to Pontiac with. John at the controls. That was a good time. And Thunder Over Michigan, the first year I got a photographer's pass. 
Um, those are the highlights of that summer. In fall of 2015, I continued the, um, the empennage work. I started working on stands. Um, let's see. And yeah, this is into November. Uh, by that time, I had the, the metal work complete on the uh, empennage and the stand had pretty well evolved. That's, that stand went through a lot of evolutions. I think I might have talked about it here before, but um, I still use it to this day. I, I, I thought I was going to do donate it to the chapter, but I found too many good uses for it at the hangar, so somebody can borrow it from me at some point. But Okay, um, January, April, another long layoff. No shop heat yet, uh, so can't really work in there. Um, and I was waiting for kits too. One thing I did do in 2016 in April on, uh, is I attended the Synergy Air Quick Building course in ben, Bend, Oregon. Highly recommend Synergy Air for builder assistance and uh, uh, RV. They specialize in RV uh, build training. Uh, really good organization. Matter of fact, I believe they're involved in the the certif certified builds of the RV-12. So, and this, I learned a lot of v valuable stuff. You can see the practice uh, project at the lower left. I didn't help on that one, but I duplicated it. And you'll see that on the, uh, the uh, table up there in a minute. Uh, June 1st, uh, I ordered uh, the quick build kits and I ordered the um, Grove landing gear. Nothing to see there because I didn't get them yet. Uh, summer layoff during uh, 2016 um, because what happened is, you know, I ordered them on June 1st and there was a seven month waiting list. There's nothing I can do about that. So we, we traveled and all that. This is, Amy knew this was her last chance to have all my attention. <laughs> and then um, one of the things I did in September is I went to Wichita mainly to attend the um, uh, Sherwin Williams Aerospace Coatings training. But I got there early and took a flight in this uh, plane. It's a, uh, a BT-23 or PT-23 uh, operated by the con uh, Commemorative Air Force Jaybird Wing in Wichita. That's another video that's on my YouTube channel among the hundreds. And there's the title page from that video. So yeah, aerospace coatings training. Um, it was a two-day course, kind of a quick thing. Well, actually, I'm not sure whether it's two or three day now that I think about it. Very valuable. You got hands-on stuff. Um, Sherwin Williams is quality stuff. Um, I was initially thinking about a flat paint scheme. And I kind of went back and forth on that. There's a long story behind that. But I ended up going with a um, Sky Skates General Aviation, which is a two-part uh, glossy finish. Um, the one great thing about it is very durable finish. So this was valuable training. While I was in the area, I bopped down to Tulsa and visited Barrett because I knew I wanted them to build the engine. Um, it's funny because the door says Barrett Performance Aircraft, but they're actually Barrett Precision Engines. Um, the minute I walked in the door, I saw this and I knew I was in the right place. Some of you might recognize that aircraft. It's the Poland Special. When I had my dreams of building a uh, home-built aircraft, this was the, like the, the king's crown. This was, I mean, that was set up for single seat ultra high altitude flight. This was an amazing airplane. And so I felt right at home when I walked in the door and saw that photo. I got the tour of the place, um, saw the level of workmanship they put out. That upper right hand photo is um, my brief meeting with Alan Barrett. He would uh, later go on to build the engine while I documented it and we've been very good friends ever since. Got the tour of the dyno and uh, all that good stuff. And um, then in September, I finally got uh, shop heat installed 
From October to November, I was working on assembling the paint shop uh, booth. This is, you know, it comes in components that are bo basically bolted together and covered with uh, visqueen. And uh, I've got the, the fan. I initially wanted to use the garage door as a cover, but that wouldn't work because I had a gap at the top and I would have just been recycling air. So I had to build a big door plug that went on top of the fan. And I've got an intake at the door on the opposite side and it flows air very well and when it's broken down it all stores in my shed just like that which is kind of nice and um, yeah so I received my Grove gear legs in November and yeah these these were a mixed blessing uh, if those of you who remember what I've gone through with uh, the leaks. We'll talk about that later. Um, I also received my paint supplies in December of 2016. This was kind of an impulse buy. I probably shouldn't have done it this way because let me give you the one big advice. If you're going to paint your own aircraft, don't order the material until you're ready to use it and make sure that's when you're ready. I've thrown out over a thousand dollars worth of material that expired um, because I didn't want to risk having it screw up the paint job. Some things, some of the components you can get away with, some of them you can't. So that's my biggest uh, advice I can give you there. Um, I also worked on practice projects. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of those later, but you can see the three on the, the table. You can, after I'm done talking here, you can look at those at your leisure. Um, on February 7th, another milestone day. Oddly enough, my wedding anniversary. Boy, I get away with murder. Um, my quick build kits finally arrived. And it's funny, I got a lot of um, <clears throat> flack from my volunteers um, because they saw that trailer drive up and they said, Darn it, Marty, you ordered the wrong kit. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I can live with that. I, I, I can I can settle for a factory five Cobra. Yeah, I can do that. You know, if it, instead of getting a Barrett engine, I'll get a Roush engine. Piece of cake. But yeah, it arrived in the middle of a ice storm, which made tracking it in uh, pretty interesting. By the way, well, I'll get to this in a minute. But we got it all in safely. Tracked it into the. Uh, my shop and that one garage door does not have a driveway to it so you got to get it over the lawn which is interesting I had to keep the snow plowed on that one strip <laughs> of grass to make sure I could get the kits in was really happy to be able to sign that bill of lading and the volunteers uh, that day were Shunsuke Shibata, um, Herb Shulke, Dan Strayer and my daughter Naomi and her boyfriend Andrew and there I am looking over my newfound booty. And uh, pretty happy with uh, having it there. Yep, I was in uh, my happy place all right. <laughs> so another, very shortly thereafter, another big milestone. I finally became an airport tenant. I've worked at... Um, I worked at uh, San Jose International as a fueler for 11 years and trained and flew at Palo Alto, which is a very visitor-friendly airport. But to become an airport tenant, to have a gate key, was a milestone that I just basked in. This was a very special, I, I felt wonderful once I, I crossed this threshold and uh, got into November Row. Um, I, of course, being me, I had to do the drawings and, okay, how is my airplane going to fit in here and what space do I have to work with? And um, it's interesting how that has evolved um, now that the airplane's actually there. It's a much more friendly, user-friendly space than I even dared hope. And during the build, of course, the vehicles and toys that were displaced by the kit were stored in the hangar. This is obviously a much later photo because you can see my completed empennage in the background. But I included it just to show you that, yeah, this was part of it. You know, there's a lot of shifting around that goes with uh, building an airplane, especially in my case. So, okay, then 
in February 2017, we also started working on stands and storage. I got the wing stand put together, started working on my fuselage stand, which would go through a continuous up, up evolution as the, the project continued. So there's the, the trio of stands on full display. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, so at this point I put the fuselage and empennage in the garage portion and uh, began my wing work. And the wings were pretty looking pretty finished, but there's a lot of little stuff that needs to happen to get them finished. So I was starting that work. Um, and um, during March, um, I placed my deposit with Aerotronics for my panel. And, um, you know, that, that was another waiting list that I was on. April 21st, 2017, I began working on the fuselage. I got it back over to the um, shop side. You can see it's still on the rolling thing, but I craned it off and put it on the work stands for a more stable uh, base. And uh, started out by working on the, the, the floors. And um, let's see. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, working on the floors. In the meantime, in May, May 22nd, I placed uh, the deposit for my Classic Aero Designs uh, upholstery and, and seat material. And um, they, they built the seats and provided some other cockpit amenities. Um, and then August and... Okay, hang on. I'm not referring to my notes correctly. So, yeah, I started that, started that. Um, I started working on painting. started working on um, actually spraying with a spray gun instead of a rattle can. That was quite the learning curve. I thought, well, I'll start with the stars and bars. You know, I built up a little test palette and masked it up and thought it turned out pretty good. But I wonder how many of you realize just what, how wrong that is. Um, the, the star is supposed to be white, the round is supposed to be blue. <laughs> so it got sanded off, and it got uh, remasked, and it got corrected. And uh, you'll see blotches on it. That's because, see how the, the gray and the green fade? Well, Sherwin-Williams sells a blending solvent that you can spray that helps smooth everything out and make it all one layer. And in my training, they used to use these little squeeze bottles. So I got some of those squeeze bottles. I tried to apply this stuff. It came out in big blotches and just ruined a perfect paint job. So I had to sand those down and touch them up. And so now it's got patina, I guess. And it currently lives in the hangar. I would have brought it to show it to you, but it's got a bunch of stuff attached to it now. so. It kind of needs to stay where it is. So then I started working in July of 2017, working on the interior panels. Um, again, learning how to paint. Um, Love-hate relationship there. Uh, the interior was shot with a flat uh, interior green, kind of a mill spec. And, uh, you know, temporarily fitted up the... Uh, cockpit seating and finally got to the point where I could sit in the airplane and make uh, the fuselage and make airplane noises every builders dream um, so in August 4th of 2017 I did receive those seats um, classic era designs I wanted canvas seats most of theirs are in leather or faux leather they actually sourced a special material from her hooker harness that happened to be the perfect color. I was very thrilled with their work. Um, so then I started working on attaching the stabilizers uh, to the fuselage in August of September 2017. Um, this was kind of an evolution here. You know, started playing with hooking up the controls. 
started working on uh, initial gear fitment, they would come back off, um, did a you know preliminary uh, alignment to make sure I was drilling the holes right, and um, then the gear had to come off. The fuselage was flipped again. The empennage was removed uh, to uh, prepare for painting. September 29, 2017, my um, Airtronics Avionics uh, arrived in a big old box. They did beautiful workmanship. That's what it looks like. And I made kind of a mistake on letting them design it this way because I can't, um, the circuit breakers are set on kind of a sub panel that surrounds the main panel. I shouldn't have had any wiring going to those sub panels because it would have been much easier to remove that center section. Right now, unless I want to take all those circuit breakers and stuff out, I have to, the only access I have is pulling that EFIS screen. So that's something I would have changed in the future. So then I started getting ready to um, um, paint the um, fuselage interior. A couple other things that happened right before this. Um, October uh, 2nd, I placed my deposit with Barrett Precision Engines for the engine. October 3rd, I placed a deposit with Whirlwind Aviation for the prop. Those, uh, those were five and seven month waiting periods respectively. Uh, so I started uh, getting ready to paint the fuselage interior. I just wanted to spray that flat neutral green. I wasn't worried about great coverage. This is a military aircraft. I don't want it to be pretty. I want it to work and have some halfway decent coverage. And uh, it worked out okay. I was just spraying right over the, the van's um, uh, wash primer. So that made it a little bit easier. And let's see. So then um, I... Uh, in October, I had ordered the Veterman exhaust. October 23rd, I re re uh, received my firewall forward kit. And lots of parts in there. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, i got to figure out all this stuff now. And, um, you know, the analogy I always made about RV kits. The early kits, they take you, it's like a, rest, it's like a cookbook. They give you the exact uh, materials. They give you the exact quantities. They give you the... The heat ranges, the times. As you get into the other stuff, they they give you the materials list. They give you the the rough order, but you got to figure out some of the details. And when you get to the finish kit, they're all oh yeah, don't forget to eat. <laughs> so yeah, the the further you, you get into the build, the more complicated it gets, and the more you're on your own. This is the Veterman exhaust with the uh, superior engine. I couldn't use the stock Vans exhaust. So I had to get a Veterman 4 into 4. And um, it made some things a little bit more complicated, but boy, it's, I can tell you personally, it sounds beautiful. And then on um, November 10th, I received the finish kit. Um, another big box filled with expensive parts. This is all the fiberglass, the plexiglass, the, some more weldments. The uh, wheels, tires, brakes, all that kind of stuff. Okay, in December 2017, I'm working on a lot of different things. Uh, these are the fuselage boards that you need to cut out and lay on the laundron so that they can support somebody's weight, whoever's bucking the uh, rivets for the top or the aft uh, top skin. I worked on uh, the getting the brakes fitted and the fuel pump fitted and uh, started uh, plumbing the lines. The, the Grove airfoil, airfoil gear have um, uh, lines gun drilled into the, uh, into the gear legs which is wonderful and it's also a tremendous pain. I'll get into that later. This is the, the, I'm calling it the roll bar for simplicity. I think Vans refers to it as the windshield support bar or something. Um, but I noticed when I tried to fit it, it, it seemed a little narrow. And, you know, weldments can vary. 
I talked to Vans, they said, well, you know, you can pull that out a little bit. So I used my cherry pricker and um, I took measurements and double checked it and got it to the, the spec I wanted and got it to fit the fuselage just right. It may not have been wise, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, continued working on the top half skin. This is setting the uh, shoulder strap uh, brackets. And also started working on the top forward skin. And uh, working on the baggage door. Um, and then I started in January 2018. I'm working on the in getting the instrument panel installed so I can start real wiring. Now this is those wing panels that I or those outer panels of the the um, instrument panel that I was telling you about. When I clecoed those in, matter of fact, if you can see right over here, you'll see two clecos on either side. Boy, I had to push on those to get them to, to engage. And what that made me realize is that the weldment wasn't off. The fuselage was built wide. And that became an issue for the rest of the, the kit. Uh, so many other things didn't quite fit the way they were supposed to, like the top forward skin. I had to make alterations. And what I really should have done is just strap that fuselage until the roll bar fit. But that's okay. We all... This is the learning curve that we all go through. I got the instrument panel installed. And, uh, you know, in February 2018, I'm working on avionics. I'm working on, uh, that's the ELT. I had to make that custom bracket. I'm working on controls. Um, you know, and getting it pretty wired up. And then in February, or I'm sorry, March 19th, 2018, uh, I got the word that the uh, engine was going to be built, and you, some of you remember the presentation I did on that. Um, started out looking like that, ended up looking like that. Uh, this is the beginning process of fitting it to the dyno. Um, it was built as an 80 ho 180 horse. It came out to just about 190 horse. Alan teased me. He said, I stamped the data plate wrong because the data plate said 180 uh, horse. I said, well, tear it down and start over. <laughs> um, eventually got it home and started the first uh, cocooning process of it. And then, again, continued on the fuselage, continued on um, avionics. Uh, and then in... Um, April 16th, 2018, I headed down to Ohio to Whirlwind to uh, pick up my prop that was finally ready. They share this facility with Titan, and there was another electronics company whose name escapes me. But it was really neat going in there because you had all the, the Titan uh, P-51s in there, as well as all the propellers. Uh, my propeller was already crated, so I didn't want to have them uncrated just to take a photo, but this gives you an indication of what kind of workmanship they do at Whirlwind. Got it home. Obviously the long box is the prop. The tall box is the spinner. And okay in May I started getting ready to rivet the um, aft top skin which uh, was completed in, uh, on May 8, 2018. My daughter Naomi helped me with this. Uh, she she was the perfect size to fit in the, the fuselage and she was interested and I trained her how to rivet and to this day I'm proud of the way that worked out. She would, turned out to be an wow. a excellent Sorry. worker. You'll see in this shot, look at the, uh, the wristband with the uh, rivet gauge slipped in there. Uh, yeah. She checked almost every rivet she did and when one was a little shy she said, I'll give this one a little bit more love. And uh, we, she did a great job. I was really proud of her for that one. So yeah, then we get into May. I uh, fuselage, avionics, cockpit, and, and stuff like that uh, got worked on. I f did some initial fitting the, of the the um, cockpit. Started working on the forward uh, top forward skin and um, the baggage door. 
And then came the first uh, wing fitting, another milestone. Um, because the wings needed to go on so I could drill the holes and set the incidents and get the controls rigged up. Uh, my helpers here were uh, Ted Gauthier, Terry Kohler, and Kurt Martin and Dave Pohl, all the uh, PTK gang. Um, they helped me get these fitted. A lot of wiggling and checking and uh, some light tapping with a hammer, but um, they went in pretty well. I will say. And then of course, you know, I'm, it's so nice to see a completed airframe and I had to bask in that. And I got the, uh, the I set the incidents by drilling that aft spar hole, which is a very critical assembly. Was really happy about the way it turned out because those holes are centered and my wing incidents is just where it's supposed to be. So that was pretty good. However, you, some of you have seen this meme before. One thing I forgot to do when putting the wings on is putting the control uh, push rods in the wings before I put the wings on. And uh, yeah, I should have done that because I realized, okay, I got to drill a hole in at least one wall, if not two, to get these push rods in. So I chose the interior wall and fed both push rods into the right wing the left push rod had to go through the center section, which was a nightmare, and then into the left wing. But I got it done, got the controls rigged, and needless to say, those things stayed in when the, <laughs> the wings yeah. were removed. Yeah. Um, let's see. So then, uh, yeah, I set up the controls, and then the wings had to come back off. Fuselage had to get flipped for the um, gear legs to go on. And um, this was the helper helping crew for um, pulling those off. Uh, Joe Carrick, uh, Bruce Breisch, Dave Buck, and Joe Fredericks helped me with that project. I was uh, grateful for that help. Uh, painted the gear legs. This is what I had to do get, to get those gear legs mounted. Gear, mounting the gear legs is one of the hardest things I faced. Um, I had to use a bore scope that you can see right here with a cable fed into the fuselage and into the gear towers so I could see this. And reaching in there blind through all these cables that are now strung through there, it was the hardest job I faced. But I got them on, I got them uh, properly aligned and I thought while it's upside down I'm going to get the, the fuselage belly painted while it's easy <laughs> to find easy. Um, did the primer and then I had to uh, put on the flat fairings and then shot the color in the clear. Again you can tell the, the my learning curve if you look at the paint job from the fuse or from the tail forward you'll see the learning curve it got better the further forward you went. But I did get the gear legs on, and uh, the axles mounted and gear aligned. And uh, also, that was November of 2018. I also went to uh, Arizona and trained with Bud Davison in the pits. You guys are aware of that. Um, this is another YouTube video. It's actually my most popular. I got, I think, 15,000 views on that one. So the fuselage gets flipped again, December. First, 2018, onto the the landing gear. That's uh, Kurt Martin, Harry Manville, Terry Kohler, Ted Gauthier, and uh, Jeff Nelson helped me do that. In um, December 2018, I drove over to Oshkosh to attend the uh, Sport Air Workshop on RV fiberglass. Right before I, you know, got to start working on it, I was really glad I did this. This is a valuable. Uh, one of the practice kits you see on that table was built um, during this training. Um, some other things I started working on was the canopy, uh, starting with the frame, getting the frame fitted. Uh, January 7, 2019, I hung the uh, engine. That was another milestone with Harry Manville. That felt pretty good. It was starting to feel like a real airplane. Um, January through March, working on firewall, 
firewall forward work, getting wires and controls connected, and started on the baffle work. Um, March through May, it was wiring work mainly in the fuselage and setting up the harnesses for the wings, and eventually got it so that the wiring was pretty much done. Um, May 2nd, 2019, some of you attended the uh, home builders meeting that took place at my shop and also at uh, Leo Nolden's shop. That was a wonderful day and, uh, you know, another kind of a milestone because you guys got to see the project in person and, uh, you know, got to make suggestions and uh, it was a good, good time. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so June 22nd, I started working on the forward top skin. Uh, that's June 22nd, 2019. Gary Conrad, some of you guys, guys might know him from the Livingston County chapter. He um, helped me rivet that on. He made the mistake of, we were at breakfast that morning. I said, I'm looking for a volunteer. And he says, well, I'll help you. I kept him there for eight hours. <laughs> but he... Great, great guy, great helper, also an RV builder, and uh, got it done. So then uh, we started working on the fiberglass work, the, the infamous fiberglass work. Um, started working on the uh, empennage tips. Started working on the first cuts of the canopy. And um, then I got the fuselage back over into the garage. Started setting up the paint booth. Uh, for not only fiberglass work, but uh, painting the uh, empennage because I wanted to get the empennage finished and out. Uh, this is me masking the tail. Again, you look closely at those letters and you'll see I used some weird stencils for the first time and the last time. You look close and it's ugly. There, there's some rough spots to this empennage, but I've got, co it's coated and it's, you know, it's a monu monument to a first-time builder. I'll, it'll fly like that. So, yeah, I, you know, working on the fiberglass. And, and uh, meanwhile, I get the uh, verticals done first. Get those in storage. Continue on the horizontals. You might have seen this meme. I had to build that jig in back because I had to be able to flip-flop that to get a decent paint job. So that can actually be lifted up and then flip the other way to paint the other surface. So I got that done and then finished up the, um, the tips of the uh, elevators, got those painted and the trim tab painted. And then I was able to um, get the empennage to the hangar on October 23rd, 2019, another momentous, momentous day. Got it all wrapped up and there it is on the famous empennage stand. Uh, waiting the rest of the airplane to show up. Uh, November 10th, the prop got put on the engine. And uh, I thought it would be on there for a while. We all know it's coming with that. But um, From January to June of 2020, a lot of cowling, a lot of baffle, a lot of snorkel work. Um, the cowling, the baffles, the snorkel, and the uh, canopy took forever. And there was a lot of switching back and forth getting this work done. Um, here I'm starting to fit the baffles. You use the paper clip thing to determine, you know, you get the baffle started and then you got to start working on the cowling to get the cowling to fit. And then I... Uh, decided to make my own custom snorkel, so I went through all this stuff. It'll be interesting to see if that turns out to be a viable design because it's a little bit different from stock. But, um, and then, you know, trying to get the cowling fitted and dialed in, fitting the bottom and fitting the baffles. And uh, then I came up with these stands uh, for the cowling halves for the paint booth and got the nose bowl kind of in shape. Uh, and then I uh, started working on the canopy trim again, preparing for the big cut. Mm -hmm. um, 
Terry Lutz and Carl Franz helped me on this. We were really hoping to get the big cut done that day, but the trimming took too long. But they got me squared away and talked me through what I needed to do. And um, then I was able to clamp the thing, get it all secure, make that big cut, and now I had a canopy and windscreen. Another kind of a milestone there. June through October, the canopy work continued. Long process this. You do a lot of clamping, sanding, uh, carving, smoothing, because every time you cut the edges, you got to smooth them so you, they won't crack. Eventually, you can get it where you can clico it on, and then you're sanding it to make sure that uh, the two halves nest correctly. Then you have to start working on the uh, skirt, um, which is a nightmare. The skirt is one of the hardest parts of the build to get fit properly. I'm still not happy with the way mine fits, but it'll fit well enough to fly. I've seen much better, I've seen much worse, so I'm happy with that. I made one modification to the frame uh, for a pull uh, handle. So to make it easier to pull the canopy straight back to open it. And um, I installed these grab handles, which I'm so glad I did. It makes getting into the plane so much easier. And I uh, got the canopy latch dialed in. There's a lot of fettling that goes into that because you kind of chase your tail between the way the canopies have fit together and the way the latch needs to fit. And then I had to, once the canopy was the way I wanted it, I need to recover it and everything while I continue to work on the skirt. Then, uh, let's see, um, in October 14th, 2020, I got back to work on the uh, wings. Um, got the uh, pedo mast firmly squared away, got the um, um, autopilot controls. Uh, connected, got the fuel tank senders uh, sealed and installed, and then Dave Buck helped me rivet on the uh, bottom skins, another milestone when you close out those bottom skins of an RV. Uh, Dave was a great helper on this. Uh, we pushed through, it was a long nine hour day, but we got the job done. and. Um, Hopefully you won't see the blemishes that I know are there, because they're on the bottom. <laughs> and when we were done with all that, uh, the wings had to get back into the um, cradle um, so I could work on the, the tips. Joe Kirk, uh, Tom Smith, and Shinsuke helped me uh, get those back into there. And then I started working on the fitting the wing tips. Um, you know, uh, drilling, dimpling holes, and then uh, installing nut plates because I wanted the tips to be removable. And then fitting the uh, aero LED lights and the, um, the, uh, the light covers. And uh, coming along nicely. And then, da 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 da! That damned FAA AD 2020-25-12, the crankshaft AD, that meant my brand new zero time, 45 minutes on the dime, no, $30,000 engine that I'd been taking so such careful care of for two years, had to come off. So first, uh, December 20th, the prop came off. Christmas Day. I had to pull off the baffling and pull the engine and put it into storage again. But I couldn't let that stop me. I'm too far down the road, or I should say up the mountain now. So I kept working on the canopy. And uh, from January till May of 2021, working on that canopy, working on the fairing. Got the uh, windscreen all molded in and uh, shot flat black. And uh, then I put the fuselage up on to a couple of uh, stands lent to me by uh, Harry Manville. It needed to be elevated in a level position so that I could get the uh, wheel fairings uh, aligned and uh, 
mounted. And uh, worked on the intersection fairings a bit. And then uh, April 15th, uh, the engine was finally returned to Barrett. And it's, I got hauled out of that thing. <laughs> As a, that's the way I had to haul the engine from side to side. That's one of the reasons I built that table the way it was. Uh, got it eventually loaded into the Explorer and uh, drove it back to Barrett. Uh, Monty Barrett uh, helped me offload it and it would sit there for another six months waiting for the uh, AD which still hasn't been fully resolved. The, uh, Alternate method of compliance has not been approved yet, so I'm, I had to buy a new crank. You all know that. Continued working on the fa uh, fuselage and got ready to get the fuselage painted so I could get that out the door. Got the base coat on. Uh, Joe Lucia shot that beautiful nose art before I shot the clear coat. Um, another great video on my... Uh, uh, channel is the time lapse of him putting this together. And eventually, in uh, July, it was ready to go out to the um, out to the uh, hangar. And uh, let's see, I think I got yeah. So in the meantime, I also got the canopy painted because the canopy had to be done before the fuselage was uh, uh, hauled. During this time, I also worked up my wing rotation jig for the paint booth. The wings had to be painted one at a time, so there was a lot of switching back and forth, which you'll see in a minute here. But yes, at last I had the canopy on the fuselage, and I was ready to get the fuselage to the hangar. This went way better than I thought it would. That trailer that I rented was ideal for the, the job. But, Got another wonderful time lapse uh, video on my channel of this, and uh, it was so great to displace those vehicles and get the fuselage in there, you know. So then, uh, yeah, so then I started working on the uh, cowling uh, July through September, working on the cowling painting and the wings painting. Meanwhile, I'm running back and forth between the shop and the hangar did the uh, beginning of the fitting of the empennage, run back to the shop, do the um, testing of the wings to make sure they're, they're um, holding air, therefore they won't leak before I paint them. And uh, then I finally get the final assembly done on the uh, empennage, start spraying the wings, and again one wing would get painted put into the garage, the other wing would go into the paint booth. My neighbor, um, uh, James Turner, helped me move those. And uh, eventually the wings are ready to go to the hangar. So this was another momentous day, uh, August 25th, 2021. Another uh, eventfully uneventful journey. Uh, Got them stowed and got them on saw horses, kind of prepping them for mounting. And uh, before I did that, well, okay, I these I did these a little bit out of order. Um, I got the wings bolted on. Um, my helpers there were Harry Manville, Dave Pohl, and Bob Sulchback, who's a member of this chapter, uh, also building an RV-8 in Ann Arbor. Um, and it's so great to see it, like, really coming together. Um, I uh, got the um, uh, ailerons and flaps painted, started getting them rigged up. You know, connecting tubes and wires here. And eventually, I've got flaps and ailerons installed. Got the wing wires uh, routed and connected and tested. And then um, in October of 2021, I flew to Texas for my initial transition training with Bruce Bohannon. He's got the only 
dual control RV8 in the world. And that's why you'll never see pictures from me of his setup because he guards that religiously. But uh, I can't say enough about Bruce's uh, transition training. I Hopefully at some point I'll do a presentation on that. Um, October through November, final assembly continued. Uh, fuel and brake testing. And this is the infamous Grove gear leak that I fought. I also had issues that um, cropped up with my uh, fuel pump not working, but fortunately uh, Airflow Performance stood behind their product and uh, rebuilt it for the cost of shipping. My daughter Naomi helped me do the, the first successful fuel flow test. Then another bombshell. Um, November 5th, 2021, we lost Ted Gauthier in a plane crash of his RV6. Still don't know exactly what happened. No, it involved an engine failure. But uh, he was a dear friend, a very strong mentor and influence and inspiration. Uh, yeah, that was a gut punch for sure. Uh, but I wasn't going to let that stop me. If anything, I thought of him as I continued to press forward. Um, the engine was finally rebuilt. Um, I ended up buying a new crankshaft and uh, on November 18th I, it was rebuilt. I made a whirlwind trip 48 hours to Tulsa and back, picked it up. That's at the factory. This is uh, packed and ready to go home. And I was able to bring it directly to the hangar which was nice. And then it sat on the uh, engine stand one more time. Fortunately not very long this time. Um, November 23rd the engine was remounted with the help of Kurt Martin. Boy that looks good to me. <laughs> um, December of last year was spent connect, reconnecting the controls, wiring, baffles. Uh, not nearly as easy as you'd think. Um, but it happened. Uh, Harry and Kurt helped me get the prop back on. And then January and February, the best time to do fiberglass work in an unheated hangar, but <laughs> had to be done. I started working on the intersection fairings. Another note, get all your intersection fairings uh, done during basic fabrication. You'll thank yourself. That's what Leo did. And he had his plane ready to fly in no time. I had still a lot of fabrication to do. I'm not real happy with the current status of these, but they're ready to fly. I might refine them this summer. Uh, let's see, um, on February 16th, we got the weight and balance uh, performed. Again, the usual su suspects. Uh, Harry and Kurt helped me out with that. I was real happy with the way the weight and balance came together. Uh, 1104 is what it came in, uh, 1104 pounds. That's a real good weight for an RV. And luckily enough, it wasn't as nose heavy as most uh, RVs are. Um, I've got a pretty nice friendly envelope with this airplane. Um, okay, February 28th, I did the, uh, check the prop run out. Uh, tolerance is a quarter inch, which seems like kind of a lot. I was within an eighth of an inch, so I was happy with that. And uh, did my first engine turnover and built oil pressure. Took a couple of calls, and a, you know, because it wasn't coming up at first, I called Gus Warren at DCT. Uh, the you know he's the president of Chapter 194, and he talked me through it a little bit. And eventually, I had 38 psi oil pressure. Real happy with that. And then the first engine start, uh, March 4th, another momentous day. And there's, um, as you all know, that's a picture of my brain being blown away in the prop last because I lost total checklist discipline. My brain popped like a fuse. But uh, we got through it okay, thanks to my team here. You got Gus Warren, the uh, videographer there is Scooter Stinson. You've got Kurt Martin, Dave Pohl, Harry Manville, and myself. 
This was my first taxi test. Uh, that was March 18th. That went pretty well overall. It was interesting <laughs> moving my aircraft in the, from the cockpit for the first time. Then uh, March 22nd, um, uh, my avionics calibration continued with the help of uh, Thomas Smith. I have to make that distinction because of Tom Smith here. Um, Thomas Smith is uh, affiliated with Beacon Aviation. He is a G3X whiz. And um, he got me all dialed in. It's funny, um, his reward for helping me was he was my first passenger ever. He, he rode with me as we taxied to the Compass Rose, and boy, he paid for that ride because we found out that the magnetometer would not set with the engine idling because the airframe wouldn't sit still enough. So he had to push me around the Compass Rose oh. while I sat in the cockpit telling him, start, stop, start, stop. It was great. Then another, this was the uh, finish line, really. Airworthiness inspection done by Matthew Tomshek, DAR-F out of Ohio. Looked it over real quickly, gave me some uh, squawks that I took care of. One embarrassing thing that I forgot to put in my notes here. I broke off the baggage door key in the lock during this inspection. <laughs> oh. uh, I, 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 you got to be kidding me. But we got it working with a screwdriver. And you know what? It's going to work just fine with a screwdriver because it's a stiff latch and a screwdriver is a lot stronger than a key. So I'm going to keep it that way for a little while anyway. He, we went through the paperwork and there it is. The, the handshake every builder dreams of. So it's a legal airplane. I've got an airworthiness certificate. So then it's time to put it all back together. And I put it all back together. The wheel pants are off in this photo because I want to fly it uh, through phase one without wheel pants. Um, but I couldn't resist. I knew I was going to have to wait. And I knew I had at least a couple of sunny days. So I had to do a photo shoot. I had to have the glamour shot. So I, I threw on the uh, wheel pants and the you know intersection fairings, just so I could take a few nice photos and you know pop it out of the hangar for all to see on a Sunday. Funny thing is, it uh, didn't attract the crowds quite yet because everybody was too busy enjoying the weather and flying their own airplanes. And this is the way it looks right now. It's sitting uh, in the hangar. Um, awaiting the fateful day. Uh, the past two days before this I went back to Texas, uh, got a little bit of recurrency with Bruce. That was an interesting trip. Um, I was worried because I was kind of under the gun and there was a whole lot of stuff going on in my life that was uh, making it hard to concentrate. Uh, a lot of lack of sleep, um, the second day, I told Bruce up front, I said, you know, I wouldn't pass an I'm, I'm safe checklist today, and the weather's kind of crappy, so I mean, if I was flying by myself, I wouldn't be flying. And he said, yeah, I know, but I think you've got it in it in you. I've got your back, so let's, let's go do this. Let's dig deep and go do this. So we did, and I had the best flying day I think I've ever had in my life. So that gave me a lot of confidence. So that's where we're sitting right now. I'm, uh, matter of fact, while setting up here, I was receiving texts from my test pilot, Dave Carrick, over the CH2A. It's probably going to happen sometime the last, last week of um, this month. I'm not going to announce the date because this isn't the time for a crowd or a celebration. You know, you, you keep your head on the task at hand during first flight. Eventually, there will be the, the party that I invite all my helpers. Another interesting stat. I crunched the numbers so far on the helpers and totted up all their numbers and the combined man hours. And I've got over 4,000 hours on this. And I was amazed to find out that only 96 hours of those man hours were with helpers. That blows my mind because when I talked to uh, Van at a forum at Oshkosh and um, 
uh, what's his name, Ken, Ken, um, Ken Scott. I asked him how much a builder could really do by himself, and Ken said, oh, I'd say we, you could probably do 90%. And Vans cut in, he said, no, no, I, I'd say 95%. Well, geez, as it turns out, according to my numbers, I did more than 99% of this by myself. Wow. That's weird to think about. But yeah, so that's where I'm at. Any questions? And by the way, if you do have questions, I'm sure that once the lights come on, my brain's going to pop like a fuse, so all bets are <laughs> off. But feel free to ask questions. If anyone wants to get the lights, and like I can say, I've got the pra pra Yeah, if you can get those lights. I've got the practice projects up there. Um, the one, the one on the left there is a duplicate of the, the one that I learned how to do at Synergy Air. And based on that experience, I went ahead and did that middle one on my own. I built my own little uh, cockpit of, um, you know, you know, got my own scrap stuff and just kind of cobbled that together to see how it would work out. The mascot is, um, is my favorite because that was a, something I got for Amy. And of course, most of you might know that my wife Amy is a bilateral amputee, and so that mas mask, or I'm sorry, that mascot had to be named Douglas Bear Dare. <laughs> Those of you who don't know, he was a World War II fighter pilot who had both of his legs amputated and continued to fight. Yeah. So of course she thought this has got to be Douglas Bear Dare. And then that third one was the uh, one I did at the Sport Air Workshop that I finally brought home and finished off. So, so that that's uh, I pulled it off 45 minutes. I can't believe it. Like I say, feel free to ask me any questions either now or afterwards. Is there any significance to the end number? Yes, but if I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> um, yeah, the basically. The, the three numbers are fairly significant to me. Um, six is my lucky number. One is the year I was born, or five, seven is the year I was born. And um, AR was available. And I thought, well, my cat's name is Romeo, and he's an alpha male, so he's Alpha Romeo. <laughs> so that's where that came from. And if you guys are familiar with the squadron markings on uh, World War II aircrafts. Um, the two letters designate the squadron code. The single letter is the um, indication, of, or it's the designation for that individual aircraft. So, um, and they're always laid out in that pattern. So, in, on the right side, it spells out my, my uh, initials. On the left side, it's an anagram of my initials, so mm -hmm. that's where that came from. And the falsifier was just something I thought of a long time ago, because so many guys do the Warbird thing, and uh, you know they go to the thing of the fake Merlin stacks, and they go with an authentic paint job and gun ports painted on, and one guy's actually assembling gun ports with light lighted, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, come on. I mean, it's my Warbird, but I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going <laughs> to. Bring the level of authenticity or pretense to that level. No, no so fake that, bullet holes. Or anything. No, so I mean, falsifier is perfect. You know, a, a, a forty-five with a bang flag. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. That's what that airplane is. So yeah, that's where all that came from. Any other questions, or if so? Uh, oh, I was going to ask. What did you? Uh, learn about the engine preservation versus what you have to do to you know get the right oil in it and start it up. Do you have to change a filter? Uh, no, I did not. I, I did confer with um, with Barrett on that and they said um, no, they, they took that into account. Um, there wasn't a lot of preservative oil in that they you know so they said yeah there's no you you won't have to change the filter. Um, you know you're going to run what that that oil for what 10 hours or something before you change it anyway so
But yeah, it's not going to cause any trouble. You run the straight. Is the striping on the rudder? Yeah. Is the striping on the rudder a military marking? Well, kind of. Again, this is one of. The, they used to do that for the trainers. They didn't do it for the fighters, you know, because obviously that's not camouflage. But I always loved that, um, you know, red, white, and blue tails on the the, the trainers. And I was going to just do red and white, uh, just because I didn't want to mask the, the blue but then I realized you know trying to paint that thing it makes more sense to do the right on the the flat vertical surfaces and then on that rounded part I can mask off the red and white and just do the blue so it's kind of a narrow blue that you don't really see unless the the uh, runners one side to the other but um, yeah it's I'm, I've definitely mixed my metaphors a lot on this airplane, and that's fine because that's this is my airplane. That's the way I wanted it. You know, you can call it clown paint all you want. This is the way I wanted my airplane. <laughs> you know. Where's the landing light on? It's actually incorporated into that tip light. It's going to be very interesting because I've got landing and taxi lights, but I don't. I've got limited control as to how much I can. <laughs> angle them. So it's going to be really interesting to see. I don't know whether those are going to be of any use to me on the ground at all. We're just going to have to see how that plays out. Um, I'm not planning to do a lot of night flying, but I do want to be able to fly at night. I wanted it to be, you know, available to, you know, I wanted the lighting. But, um, you know, I could have saved myself a tremendous amount of time and headache by making it a day VFR only plane. It's just one of those decisions that I made that there were advantages either way. Did you set him up to wigwag? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, there's two different ways of doing that. Um, Aero LED builds that into their system, but Aerotronics builds it into their system too. So we choose to use the pulse instead of the wigwag. And that's what, um, that's what, um, did I say Barrett? I meant to say Aerotronics. Um, so instead of using the Aero LED wing wag feature, I use the um, Aerotronics pulse feature, which is interesting because I just only recently realized that you can pulse those without having the other, without having the other light switches on. So there's going to be a whole lot of things I'm going to be figuring out as I go, as you well know. There's um, so many ways you can put stuff together. And yeah. Like, Wait a and like, okay, how is this really working? I mean, I, I put it together the way they told me. Now, what's really happening here, you know? You made a comment at the start of this when it's like all together. You say, ah, finally all together. I'm not going to take it apart. I'm like, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think so, huh? My ass and the rest of me too, you know? <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. Dan, once you got your plan together, how often do you have to take it apart before you said it's it's well, well, after much the done. fire or no? I <laughs> 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 now, luckily, you know my panel's the terrifying thing, you know. I, I tried to do clever things so it's modular and I could take <coughs> things out. Oh my gosh. It's just a nightmare, so I had to replace the lithium ion batteries in the two Dynon, you know, like computers okay. in there, mm -hmm. just last year. And uh, that ended up being uh, easier to reach in the back and take other stuff out of the way than take the whole Dynons out. You know, there's just so much going on. That's really a pain, especially on these single seat airplanes, because you don't have enough room. I know. You know the, the narrow ones. Like, your comment about those side panels is... <coughs> Really think about that stuff. Yeah, and when, the, I guess the, the the idea is you design for service, you know, or build for service. Yeah, yeah. Because on mine, they wanted you to just put the panel in. Well, there were some cables that get installed, and they're hardwired through the firewall, and, and so we modified and cut that off. And mm -hmm. when I built the harness, I made the harness long enough that I could pull it out and tip it down to get to the back panel to disconnect stuff. Yeah, for me it was. I was guesstimating the lengths of the harness that, because Aerotronics built the harnesses, but they're going off the numbers I gave them. Well, I didn't have things in place to do exact measurements. I mean, you know, some of those things that I was measuring for, I hadn't built the bracket. I didn't know where that bracket was. So I was, 
So I ended up with some bundling back there that I wish, you know, my OCD was thinking this is a snake's nest and if I ever have to troubleshoot a connectivity issue in this mess from underneath the panel, uh, you know, it's going to be crazy. Okay. Do but what then, I did. Make a couple of small friends. You know, so you make friends with a couple yeah, of small people. people. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll, I'll teach Lost my daughter underneath avionics. That, underneath that panel just fine. He can just crawl in there. And but yeah, I... Almost yeah. looks comfortable. I was amazed. I was really worried when I was doing the baggage door latches because you have to get in there to reach that firewall on that corner to get those, those Delrin anchor blocks mm -hmm. set. And I had the panel in, and I had everything in the way, and I'm thinking, how am I going to be able to reach that to get those fastened? Well, fortunately, those G3X, you get that out, you've got a fair amount of space to work with that, yeah. that screen out. It's not super easy, but the way I've got it, it's a lot easier than trying to pull out the entire section, which would mean taking all those circuit breakers out. Because I was really bummed out. They had that thing assembled perfectly, and then I realized... I've got to disassemble their work to be able to install this in the fuselages. I don't want to undo their work, but do what you got to do, you know. Yeah. So yeah, there. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's mazes wherever you you go when you get into the the builds. You know, you you chick, you choose which circuitous route you're gonna take. Yeah. The biggest uh, problem I've seen is if someone develops a fuel leak. You know, yeah. after they build it, start putting fuel in it, and paint it, and you start flying it, you know, a little drip on the floor of the hangar, and it's just, oh, mm -hmm. that's just, mm -hmm. so I put twice as much sealant as I needed them. <laughs> yeah, but, but that was um, a mess. Vans but, built my tank, so I didn't have that worry. Yeah, that, that is a real heartache, because on the vans, you take the tank off, and you cut holes in the back yeah. bulkhead, yeah. which you have to make, you know, doubler plates for later. And the whole time you're doing this, you're creating FOD and chips and shit yeah. going oh, down oh, into man. the fuel yeah. tank, Ooh. which was wet already. And then, you know, you, nooks and crannies sitting in there, yeah. and you got to hope you get all that out, and then, re you know, find the leak, seal it, and then seal up these new plates that you had to rivet or screw on to the back of the bulkhead. It's just like, man, you're almost better off building new tanks, in my opinion, because what's your life worth, you know, getting some five <laughs> in your fuel system. So, I just saw people person? do that, though. It's just I, I was wondering, what, what was the design philosophy behind no dual controls? I, I guess I, as many times well, as I've seen it, I didn't realize that it wasn't dual control. The, the only dual dual controls vans will provide is they'll provide a stick and rudder extensions and you can you can dual rig the the engine controls but there's no there's no brakes oh, yeah. and like I say Bruce is the only one on the planet who has set up full pro proper brakes for and back okay, yeah. and uh, yeah it's just it's not it's not made for that so I I ended up using the pivots um, that they that they use for dual controls and that's another long story I in terms of running the the rudder rigging I I I couldn't figure out why things weren't working I was getting some clearance issues and then I got those extensions for you know the levers and that took care of that then way down the road Somebody pointed on a forum pointed out, uh, did you know you ran your rudder cables through the wrong holes in oh. the uh, spar box? Oh. And I went, because all I could think of is, I bet there's wires in the holes where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But I lucked out. I was really fortunate those holes were still available. I think I had to drill, uh, drill out one. I think I had to enlarge a couple of them. Yeah. But at least they were still there to work with. So it's like, and then once I did that, I went, well, that's why I was having the clearance issues, because they weren't routed right. <laughs> yeah. hey, good old builder flaws. So. On, a, on a new engine, mm -hmm. uh, how high did you take the power? Uh, 
for the, the, the first well, engine start? It up. Uh, I tried to baby it up because I was told until you're starting the engine break in, you want as little time on that motor as possible. So during the engines, uh, the, the first engine run in the taxis, never more than 1400 and usually right around 1000 and I try to just minimize it as much as possible. Once the first flight takes place, then the engine break-in will start and, um, you know, then I'll be paying attention to mainly that. And once I'm comfortable with the engine break-in, then I'll start following the uh, phase one stuff that, you know, that EAA uh, outlines. How low a RPM would it idle? Well, uh, at first it was stalling because I didn't, I didn't have it dialed in. Now I think I've got it at like 700, wow. 750. But yeah, you do that and you're, you're not putting out enough alternator. So um, I found that 1,000 is a nice number. The engine is happy idling at 1,000 under most Careful. operating conditions. That will affect your landing. It was a huge battle with, with Cessna. They wanted us to lower the, the idle speed. Mm -hmm. And we were saying, no, we're not going to lower the idle speed because now the engine runs rough and then we'll have idle complaints, right? Mm -hmm. And it turned out that what they were grousing about, it was only like 50 RPM that we're talking about. Um, it affected <coughs> their landing distance because when it's power off, it actually had that much idle thrust. That mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Um it's interesting, especially after yesterday. I, uh, um, it's nice to finally start feeling comfortable flying because I got fairly comfortable during the initial transition training, and then that you know six months go by, and I got a little bit of Satabria time and a little DA40 time, and um, you know the rest was get this thing assembled. So in your training with Bruce, did did they talk about or is there any? gotchas to watch out for in flying it? Or? What, the RV? Yeah. Um, I mean, did he go most that? guys, it's mainly about just landing. The RVs, and it depends on which model it is because there's different upper intersection fairings. Bruce has got an earlier model and they're they're minuscule. They don't have a cuff on the, the uh, leading edge of the wing or anything like that. And he says based on his uh, experience, he thinks that's why the earlier models are twitchier than others on the ground because you get some turbulence because that air isn't fared enough and it'll, it'll affect the sides of the fuselage and that's what makes it a little squirrelier, which makes it uh, popular for a lot of RV8 flyers to wheel land because it's easier. Well, Bruce argues definitely against that because the way he looks at it is that um, that's fine until you run out of rudder authority during stiff crosswinds and your tail wheels up in the air. Right. <laughs> then you're in a world of hurt. So he says, teach yourself to three-point it. It can be three-pointed and it can be done safely. It may not always act like it's happy but learn how to do it because ultimately that's going to keep you a lot safer. And in matter of fact, he, you know, when I left him yesterday, he said, um, you know, you, technically you probably shouldn't do this on your first flight in the aircraft, but throw some weight in there because an, an RV-8 will three-point much happier with weight in the tail. And that's the way you've trained because you've had my butt back here. So fly from a position of familiarity and then expand your envelope to say, okay, with nothing in the back, okay, it's handling like this, and yeah, it doesn't really want to put that tail down. So that's all going to be part of the learning curve of phase one. So, because yeah, when I went for my transition training before I did the first flight, we went and explored the whole, all the corners of the envelope. And, yeah. You know, extended stalls and, you know, rudder control in the stall. And mm -hmm. I learned that adverse yaw is a really serious thing on a high drag airplane that, you know, if you move the stick yeah. at all to try to pick up a wing, it was going to roll over into a spin. Yeah. You know, so there was, 
we poked around in all those corners, but it was really quickly I found out flying the plane that it flies just like the factory plane and it's pretty mm -hmm. much a pussycat. You know, you got to work hard to get it someplace uncomfortable. Yeah, you can make an RV-8 bite you for sure because it's a fairly high performance performance airplane, but um, it's, a, it's a pretty honest airplane. It, it doesn't have too many gotchas. I mean, the trickiest thing, according to Bruce, excuse me, uh, an RV-8 is the trickiest of all the RVs to land. He says, an RV-8 will feel squirrely, and I mean, you get into an RV-3, which you'd think would be crazy, and that's a pussycat in comparison. He says, you know, he refers to it as the RV monster, the RV-8 monster. And it, the size of the monster depends on whether or not you have the upper intersection fairings that are the newer, bigger ones or the older, smaller ones. So. You mentioned the fuselage wasn't quite to spec on width. Were there any other surprises with the quick build components? Not really. Um, I'm trying to think and nothing comes to mind. I mean, that was the main thing is like you wouldn't expect that to happen. Yeah. But I mean, it was probably quarter of an inch wide. I, as I recall, when you put that uh, roll bar in and they have tabs that go down that are supposed to be flush, I had an eighth inch eighth on inch either size. side. Yeah. And I'm like, mm. well, I noticed you had a turnbuckle later in one of your other pictures. Yeah. It's like trying to pull it back together. Well, Yes, yes, that, that's right, because what I had to do is take the strain off of it when I was doing the top forward skin, okay. because I didn't want to have to, I wanted the, the top forward skin to be laying where it's supposed to be and get it riveted, and then, and I know this isn't best practice, because then you're giving shear load, you know, you're kind of building some shear loads into those rivets uh, a little bit, but... Um, that's the way it had to be done. So, you know, you kind of compromise. I, I moved one and then I moved the other and you find your happy medium. Is, is the tail wheel steerable? Yeah, it is. Okay. I'm not real happy with the way mine feels because there's a lot of dead slack in the chains and you're supposed to have some and mine are to spec, but compared to Bruce's, my, well, yeah, I'd say compared to Bruce's, mine, I, I have a little bit too much slack, but if I took that half link out, then they'd be too tight. So I'm going to err on the side of slack, which has been recommended. So there's not springs in... No, there there are springs. Okay. It's just that you don't want, you don't want the, you want a little sag in the, in the chain itself. You want um, about a half inch max, I've been told. So that's what I kind of dialed in. Any other questions? It's kind of exciting when you look at it and say, I built an airplane. Yeah. <laughs> I did have a couple of hangar basking days. You know, I'm, I'll confess to you guys because you're my brethren. I'd never want to be one of those guys, you know, who sneaks off to his airplane and drinks beer in his hangar. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be, because I do kind of a delicate dance in my life with alcohol. Okay. I, I manage it, I micromanage it because it runs in my family. But I did pick a day where I, you know, sh <laughs> shut the doors, yeah. turned off the phone, and just sat and basked. <laughs> just sat. <laughs> you know, yeah. took a drink and walked around, took pictures from angles I'd never taken before. <laughs> just had fun enjoying the fact that it's a completed airplane now, and that's, it's still stink, stinking in. There's a Freudian slip. Um, it's still sinking in, and I'm sure the first flight will take a long time to sink in. But um, and by the way, I sat in that hangar for three hours after I ran out of beer, so I'd be nice and legal on the way home. But uh, yeah, I had to. It's like, you know, I have to have my quality time. Plus, the, some of the stuff at home was starting to build up and. It's like nothing real bad, but it was like kind of cluttering my head. There's a lot, there's some chaos building up and, and it's like, uh, give me my alone time in my hangar. I, I don't want it to become my refuge, but uh, I wanted to enjoy it 
at least once, you know, now that it's complete. You know, you climb in and out of the cockpit a few times, you get used to doing that. I mean, one of the things is, I'm building this and I'm thinking two things. Number one, will I be able to get in and out of this because I'm starting to get arthritis and I'm starting to gain weight again, all this stuff. And the other issue that I may have mentioned to some of you guys is, how am I going to get Amy in, in and out of this airplane? Uh, a lot of guys will not fly with any passenger who cannot get out of the aircraft on their own. There's, that's very reasonable and very safe thinking. But if anybody on this planet thinks that I would deny Amy the chance to fly with me when she supported this fully in more ways than you can even imagine, you'd be mistaken. Yeah. yeah. You know, if I have to make one of those kind of choices, we're going out together. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not jumping out of the cockpit without her. I promise you that. Yeah. So I mean, and that sounds kind of melodramatic, and some people think, "Well, you're crazy," but we all. That's the choice I've made, and yes, we we will get a chance to enjoy that airplane as much as we can. But we'll have to figure out how she can get in and out. That's that's a hurdle we haven't crossed yet. Uh, I've tried to build it into the airplane, given the hand those extra handholds. Because I use those a lot. It was a pain getting in and out of Bruce's because he doesn't have them and you can't use that as a support, you know, because you get the fiberglass right That's there. Right. You can't rest on that. You can't grab it. So I love my little handholds because I don't need them strong. I just to help me stabilize, you know. I was at, I was at Oshkosh one time and I sat in a midget Mustang and I found out as fat as I am, I actually fit. <laughs> then the realization was, how do I get out of this thing? <laughs> <laughs> because the fuel tank's over the top of your legs. And, yeah, and yeah. when and the and the, the canopy sill is up high enough that it's not like this. It was like this. Oh God! You know, and it was just, hey Dale, get me in here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the first time I'm sure getting Amy in and out, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have the engine hoist with a you know thing overhead so that we'll get her in and out, and then from there we can figure out okay how can we get her in and out without having to resort to this. I mean, you know, it's it's a problem that'll be solved and it's what's really cool is... Will the canopy move all the way out of the way from above? Yeah. So it, in, in medicine we have, they're called Hoyer lifts. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Have you seen those? Oh, sure. I'm sure you can yeah. make something up similar to that. And just yeah, I've, I've got some ideas brewing in yeah. my right. tiny little mind, believe me. It's things that'll attach to the uh, upper longerons, you know, along the cockpit rails where I could set it in there and it would lock temporarily in place and she'd have a grab bar. It, there's all kinds of things like that. Um, I don't think I'll ever, if it gets to the point where she would have to be motor lifted in and out of the airplane, then, then I'd probably rethink it. Because that, you know, that means you fly to and from the hangar, <laughs> you know. That's not fun. That's not traveling. That's not going anywhere. So. Yeah, we'll see. It's going to be interesting to see how this all evolves. But all I know is I've got a quote completed airplane now, except for the parts that aren't finished. And, it's never uh, finished. <laughs> Are you going to make the first flight? I'm not going to make the first flight. Dave Carrick of the um, CH2A, uh, uh, Canadian Historical Aircraft Association, is going to do it. He's got a lot. He's got thousands of tailwheel hours. He's got a lot of warbird time. He's uh, been checked out in RV6s, RV7s. He did the first flight on um, Steve, Th if you know who Steve Thorne is of Flight Chops, he did the, the, the first, the test flight on his. I, I trust him. My ideal candidate would have been Terry Lutz because he was an Air Force test pilot, he was an Airbus test pilot, and he built and has been flying his own, Air, his own RV8 for 16 years. So he would have been ideal, but unfortunately he had a recent uh, medical issue that kept him out of the sky for a little while, which has since been resolved. But um, I wasn't sure at the time that that was going to be the case. So I, I, I you know, because if Dave was going to do it, he had to get a lot of ducks in a row. So I made the commitment when Terry wasn't available. Dave got his ducks in a row, so Dave's primary candidate right now. If he ends up not being able to do it by the end of this month, all bets are off. First come, first flown, as far as I'm concerned, because I want to get this thing in the air and I want to start flying it myself while I'm still fresh from Texas. So that's my thought. 
because I will do the entire phase one. That's all the that Thanks, Myron, for being yeah. up there. You know, I was talking to Myron before, and he spent an incredible amount of time just putting this together, not a, let alone, you know, you know, everything that took to have this to put together. So, really appreciate your time. I only wish my linguistics were better. I, I trip over words, something fierce. Sorry. So. Thanks. Sorry, you did. Thanks. It was good. You're, You're welcome. Good so as Martin's project comes to its next logical step, first flight, phase one, etc., there's there's room in the world for another RBA project, and our chapter uh, has been offered and we have accepted a, an RBA quick build kit from past member um, uh, Glenn Wagner, uh, and we'll be taking delivery of that. Uh, at the end of this month, it'll show up out here in the workshop. Um, there's there's interest growing to have a chapter build uh, there in the workshop, and uh, so that's uh, kind of in line with all that. Uh, it's very early in the the getting going stages, but uh, we wanted to announce uh, on RV8 night that uh, <laughs> that the chapter is receiving one, and uh, if you're interested in helping. On April the 30th, uh, move that project. Get that project moved from out Northville here. Uh, it'll be in the evening. Then uh, we'd like to hear from you. So that's it. Cool. Well, I've got an empty car hauler. You're on. What? I wish I hadn't sold all those yeah. jigs and stands now. Yeah. This is uh, <laughs> RV8 that's just been in uh, storage. On that. And, uh, Ask me about the guy. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>